Hello and welcome to the Upper Pen Podcast. My name is Dakota and today I'm talking with my favorite nonfiction author, Mary Roach. Her books include Bonk, Stiff, Spook, Grunt, Gulp, My Planet, and Packing for Mars. And today we're talking about her most recent book, Fuzz, When Nature Breaks the Law. <laughs> Thank you for joining me, Mary. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> um, so how did you get started with Fuzz? It's such a strange like topic. Uh, I know. Um, well, this is a book that started because of my kind of vague interest in forensics. And I heard about the um, National Wildlife Forensics Laboratory up in Ashland, Oregon. I was like, ooh, what is that? I'm always kind of excited if I come across some obscure, in my mind, laboratory. So uh, I uh, went up there and uh, it was a kind of a fascinating time. You know, there was a woman there, Bonnie Yates, who uh, runs the hair library, which is a very Mary Roach thing, a hair <laughs> library. Uh, these, I should say what they do is um, they're uh, investigating cases of uh, smuggling endangered species, either the animal, the pelt, the horn, whatever. So they need to be able to identify bits and pieces of different wild animals and so that that's why they have the hair library and bonnie yates who i spent time with is a, she wrote the paper on how to distinguish real versus counterfeit tiger penis and that's what i had stumbled on i was like oh my god maybe i can somehow build a book i just i, I start with like these little tiny pieces and i go maybe i could build an entire book around this so um, I went up and I spent this delightful afternoon with Bonnie and her penises. And <laughs> then I went to talk to the director of the lab and I said, well, I'm kind of, you know, just poking around, like see if maybe there's a book idea because there was all kinds of interesting stuff going on there. There's people, uh, there's this whole thing with a certain kind of cedar tree that the, the Vatican is using for the incredibly expensive incense. And I was gonna say incest. <laughs> That incense, sense. So um, I went in to talk to him, and he's like, "Well, yeah, uh, you will, legally you can't tag along on any investigation, an open investigation. Uh, no, the answer is no, you can't. And for me, that was a deal breaker because I want to be in the scene. I want to be reporting on things as they happen. I want to tag along with people, and." Uh, it, it, so that was that. But then I, I started thinking, well, what if you kind of turned this book inside out? And what if the animals were the perpetrators and not the victims? And that led me to a different obscure branch of science, which is human wildlife conflict, and which I had never heard of. I had no idea. I mean, there are textbooks and conferences and there's this whole little weird world out there of dealing with human wildlife conflict. You know, how do you keep wild animals who are not the property of some person you can sue or <laughs> complain to how do you keep them from you know eating crops or uh, shitting in the golf course or uh attacking campers so that's kind of how it happened you know and it just seemed like i could break it down by crime and i'm using air quote but they uh so i broke it down by you know manslaughter grand theft, sunflower seed, trespassing, littering, jaywalking, which of course animals do all of that and don't know that they're breaking our laws. So that, that was, brings up, the, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say that's a very long-winded <laughs> question. No, that's perfect because the one of my favorite parts was the introduction where you're talking about this old book that you found detailing crimes. <laughs> yeah, the, the criminal prosecution and capital punishment of animals, which is was written or published in 1905. And that was, I discovered that early on in the process and that kind of cemented my uh, desire to do this because it's a very strange book. I mean, people, there used to be trials. Uh, animals would be excommunicated from the church. They would be imprisoned. They would be hung. Um, and, and uh, you know, at a certain point, people realized uh, probably the legal system is not the way to go about this, that it might be better to try to use science. And that's where I step in. 
Uh, so my, the, it's, yeah, I don't cover a lot in the book about the legal stuff outside of the introduction, but that book is so interesting. They don't, you know, I opened the book with this story of this trial that had to do with these caterpillars that were, uh, and this was in the, I don't know, the 1600s, I believe, in Italy, and the caterpillars were raiding the farmer's fields. The caterpillars, you know, the hungry, the very hungry caterpillar, they're very hungry. They're doing a lot of stuff in their little bodies that are about to change. And so they they are voracious. And so there was the, the someone in the, the, one of the town fathers put up this uh, uh, on the trees near these fields, these signs uh, addressing the caterpillar saying, you are to appear in court um, <laughs> on a set date, you will be assigned legal representation. It wasn't a joke either, they were serious. And of course the caterpillars did not appear on that date. Um, but the trial went ahead anyway, and it was decided that a separate plot of land would be set aside for the caterpillars. Meanwhile, they've pupated, they've left. So as far as the townsfolk were concerned, I think it seemed like, oh, this was a good resolution. And there's those town fathers are very wise and just. So um, anyway, that was kind of astounding. <laughs> <laughs> It just seems so strange and so silly. And then the first chapter of the book, I had to um, I had to put the book down because it was so sad. It just feels like there's no good thing to do with bears and bear conflict with humans. And so I put it down for like a week and I was like, OK, I can go back now because <laughs> yeah. it's just so tragic. Uh, it, it's a very, yeah, the, the bears in particular. Do you mean the, the forensics chapter or the bears in, in Colorado? There was the there was, forensics chapter where you're at the conference and I, the, uh, yeah the I mean that was fascinating the forensics used in those cases that they're in fact yeah. methods similar you know it's treated like a crime scene and evidence is gathered in the same way and and the, I like that they the wildlife investigators that do this work um, are careful to make it sort of to be sure they have the right bear if they set if they set a trap or if the, the animal has been killed on the site of the attack they'll do dna um between the you know taken from the victim and the the animal and make sure that that is in fact that they've got in custody as it were the right animal um so that was that's good that they do that but but yeah it's um, I mean, bear attacks are so rare. They just get so much media attention. It's far more of a problem is the uh, preponderance of cases of bears just, you know, rummaging through trash and breaking into cabins and then people get upset. They call the fish and game or, or the local, you know, wildlife agency. And then, you know, if the animal is, is habituated to people food, and has lost its fear of humans, um, that ends often ends very sadly for the bear. Um, yeah. it, you know, it's deemed a, a public health hazard and um, is destroyed often. So, I mean, so there are cases where they'll try, particularly high profile media saturated cases, where they'll try to do a translocation. But those, those translocations, you know, you, you take a bear and you put it in a territory it's not familiar with. First of all, that's not a very pleasant thing for the bear, but then also this bear is likely to make its way to another human community and start doing the same thing. So the long-term prospects of these bears are not good. And it's because it's very hard to get people, you know, the irony is that people feed animals, including bears, because they want to get close to them because they love them. And they're so, it's such a, I mean, I know what, I know that feeling, you know, I was in an alley and 3 a.m. and asking <laughs> these two bears were ruffling, you know, rummaging through these sacks of food scraps from a restaurant, and it was such a thrill to be that close to them. And I mean, you lo they're lovable, they're beautiful, and people want to get close to them, and they do that by offering them food, and then ultimately they're contributing to their demise. So a lot of efforts in education uh, have gone on, and that's that's a good thing. Just letting people know how the cycle unfolds and what they're doing when they do that you know how how they're making the situation worse so but it is tough you know and and bears you know bears have made such a comeback in this country i mean we you know in in centuries past they were 
decimated. And and now they've, you know, we, we've brought them back to a level that now people are getting annoyed with them again. And now they're having to be destroyed. So it is a, a vexing problem. We have a lot of bears where I live, but they're small little black bears. Yes. Um, but they're the kind that like they can attack a dog if a dog comes up to them and gets yeah. in their space. So we always still worry about letting our dogs roam around too far because there's bears. <laughs> Yeah, the, and the and and the dogs and the dog situation is is tough because you know bears you know typically if a bear breaks in this is often black bears um, <laughs> you know if it, if it gets into someone's house or cabin which they often do in this area of Colorado where I was um, if it's just a person at home and the bear is sort of sees the person the person's kind of like sees them is startled gets up the bear turns and runs but when things really get dangerous is if there's a dog in in the home and the dog obviously the dog is going to be uh, alarmed and, and possibly aggressive defensive aggressive whatever just trying to protect its owners and its home and then the dog and the bear go at it and the person tries to intervene and then the bear turns on the person so the the having a dog in the mix can make it a deadly situation for well, the person too, but the dog and uh, it just is. Yeah, that's very sad when that happens. You know, it's. um, Yeah. Yeah, um, I do appreciate the chapter in Aspen where you're talking about the bears breaking in through the windows and then they learn that they can go in and out through those windows and people's cottages or houses are just like the fridges are left open and. <laughs> Yeah, it is really like a, you know, a crime scene that there's, you know, the the one that we went to, you know, because I was only in Aspen for a day, a night and a day. And that was enough, you know, because I thought, well, I'm going to have to be really lucky to see an actual aftermath of a bear break in. But there was one like, oh, yeah, we're heading up there right now. You know, come on, we're going. And uh, and it was just like, here's the window pushed in, you know, here's the screen kind of lying on the floor bent, lying on the carpet where the bear pushed it in. And then, you know, you go up the stairs and then you get into the kitchen and it's just mayhem. <laughs> it looks like <laughs> stuff all over the floor. And, and then they could see and then they were like, there's another window open onto this other deck. And they're like, I think that there might you know, there might have been a second bear. <laughs> or that maybe it's no 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 because the door is pushed in so this is you know they were, or you know, they were looking at all the uh, egress and you know, how did this bear get in and how many how many perps were there they didn't say uh -huh. I said perps but <laughs> bear <laughs> perps <laughs> yeah, but it, it, you know and it was interesting that they um, uh, they prefer high end ice cream they. They will not go near. There's some local brand called Western Family Brand, and the bears are like, nah, -uh, nah, -uh, no, Hagen Dazs or nothing. <laughs> they want the good stuff, you know. <laughs> so it seems, yeah. It's funny too, though, because uh, that chapter talks a lot about how there was the the new trash cans that they implemented in Aspen uh, that lock so that the bears can't get into them. But then all these rich people are putting fruit trees on their properties right yes yeah they're, they're growing it including the um the town itself um planted trees um not choke cherry what were they i haven't looked at the book in a while um crab apple so they planted in, in downtown aspen these crab apple trees because they have beautiful blossoms in the spring and yeah okay they're they're very beautiful but the bears just come along i mean because they're just covered the branches are covered with these little fruits and the you know bears particularly when they're you know looking forward toward to hibernation they want to be like a concentrated food source and um that's what those trees do so they get bears in right in downtown aspen and why because you plant a crab apple tree and and homeowners as well yeah that the, the there's a guide that the city puts out to landscaping and here's native trees that you should plant and all of the bears favorites um, oak, choke cherry, crab apple, they're all listed as recommended <laughs> trees. And I, the guy I was with who tries to deal with these conflicts is like, can you believe this? Uh, yeah. So it's it's not as easy as you would think to solve that problem. You know, people people think, oh, 
And you just get some of those bear resistant trash cans and boom, problem solved. <laughs> Not true. Well, so I can understand how you got to the place in Oregon and how you got to the forensics conference and how you got to Aspen, but I cannot see the leap from these bear attacks to India. How did you get to India? Oh, well, I, you know, I, I like to, uh, in most of my books I, I've had, I like to include sort of a cross, uh, the perspective of another culture and India, uh, a couple of its nuisance species, I'm putting quotes around nuisance, I don't like to use that word, but people know what I mean. Um, two of those, the monkeys and the elephants, um, which cause a lot of problems there, those animals are uh, representations of Hindu gods. So Hindu gods, uh, the Ganesh for the elephant and Hanuman, the monkey, um, these gods appear as these animals. So people have very powerful feelings positive feelings for them but at the same time they're deeply annoyed by them the and the elephants are you know crashing through crops and, and you know a herd of 15 elephants can devastate a village the crops of a, of a small village and also uh you know if the villagers run out and try to scare them away the herd panics it's nighttime maybe people have been drinking and people get trampled surprising surprisingly common in india uh, one statistic I saw was 500 people a year killed by elephants, but but it's um, it's it, I, I went there because I just thought it was an interesting. It would be interesting to get their perspective on how should we deal with this, to what extent should we get involved with it, and and how and the and the struggles of the wildlife department folks in in trying to resolve the issues but not upset their citizens because people you know they want the problem fixed but they don't want the animals harmed or in the case of the monkeys they don't even want them sterilized you know they're like they just want them magically to go away which is very frustrating for the folks at the the new delhi um uh wildlife department it was really interesting because you you go see a village where there's those elephants um and it's humans that are encroaching on their territory that are kind of breaking up the forests, right? Yeah. Yep, yeah, that's right, yeah. And yeah. then and then you always find these like funny little nuggets. Like the elephants really like to get drunk, so they break into the hooch or the <laughs> they do. So, I really love that kind of like aspect of these are really bad things happening, but also drunk oh, yeah. elephants <laughs> yeah, I just and i and i love that um yeah yeah but the the, the elephants elephants do enjoy alcohol and there's a local uh, home brew and people know that the elephants like to drink so they'll bring the hooch you know into the home and the, and it, it's very fragrant stuff and the elephants see no reason not to just knock down this flimsy wall to get what's inside the house. And then of course, you know, then you literally have the elephant in the room and that's not a good situation. So um, uh, yeah, but then and in the process of reporting that chapter, I found someone had actually done a study, someone in the States on how much alcohol does it take to get an elephant drunk? You know, um, and it's surprisingly little, they seem to lack that enzyme that breaks it down. And then they described like, what a drunk, you know, what a drunk elephant does, you know, and they're, they're, they're kind of like, it's kind of like humans, you know, they would kind of get too drunk, have too much sort of sway, stand around the corner, then lie down and sleep it off. But there's always one mean drunk in every herd and gets aggressive. And so it was, a, yeah, kind of a, a wonderful study that I'd stumbled onto. I, so I love that contrast of just there are funny aspects of human and animal interactions. But then, like, there's nothing that the Indian wildlife people can do, really, because they're like, well, wait until the until our, our people come and round them up and push them back into the forest. But the villagers don't want to do that, right? Well, yeah, it's very hard to, in New Delhi, um, it's been very hard for the wildlife department to hire monkey catchers. What they do with them is they catch them and they take them down. There's this piece of land in the southern part of the city that used to be a mine 
it's actually kind of pretty. I went there and they just, you know, put them there. But uh, and then they've done 20,000 rhesus macaques are down there in that plot of land. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's huge. It's not, I, mean, I expected to see just like this incredible density of monkeys, but they're, you know, scattered around and it's kind of a, it's gone wild, that, that old mine. Um, but it, it's very hard to keep someone on staff because no one wants no one wants the job of monkey catcher. It's it, it has a stigma attached to it, and it's just it's you know you're perceived to be harming in some way, even if the trapping is done in a fairly humane way. It's, it's just that nobody wants that job, uh, or, and they get the job and then they leave the job and the, the department has done things like well okay what if we just try to um particularly in the high-end neighborhoods which the monkeys love because there are more trees there's more landscaping so they you know the prime minister has monkeys in his swimming pool i mean there's there's a, a huge problem in the high income areas of new delhi so what one point the government hired people to learn to impersonate langurs, which are a larger monkey that frightens the macaques. So these men, they were all men, I believe, would go around making langur noises. I, I can't remember. I, I think I looked it up at one point. It, it, it's, I think you can probably find on YouTube videos of these langur impersonators. There were also men who had actual langurs on leashes who would go around and scare the macaques from the neighborhood, but that was illegal under the Wildlife Protection Act. So then these um, the Langer men started just spraying Langer urine, sort of dousing houses around, <laughs> around the neighborhood, um, none of which really solves the problem because it, it just moves the animals on to the next neighborhood or they come back the next day, you know. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, the problem goes on. They're looking into various types of birth control, but birth control is for animals a tough, uh, tough thing to work out because um, you know if it's an oral contraceptive, you know how do you make sure they're getting enough of it? How do you make sure that other animals that you don't want to control the birth rate of are not getting into it? Um, and so that doesn't work well with a bunch of roaming urban macaques. So you can talk about, well, uh, injections, but then you'd need most of these immunocontraceptives need a booster. So you'd have to round them up twice and uh, somehow know which ones you've given it to and which ones you haven't. It's expensive. Uh, so um, that's it's a problem. And, and And the other thing with fertility control is that it doesn't eliminate the monkeys that exist now. It just over the years, it will lower the numbers over, uh, but, the, but the public doesn't, you know, they just want to see effects. They go, you spent all this money on birth control and we have the same number of monkeys we had. I mean, monkey, those monkeys live 15 years. So people are like, we, we're not seeing any effect. So uh, that's tough. It's a tough one. It's a tough one. I feel for those monkey professionals in New Delhi. <laughs> It was funny because you bring up, uh, well, why don't you do like some kind of trash control? Uh, yeah. Like they have an Aspen and the the veterinarian guy was like, how? Yeah. <laughs> just, have you walked around New Delhi? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so it's so strange and interesting that these problems persist because people don't, they want it to change, but they don't want, they don't want to change. Right. Yeah. People are ultimately lazy and set in their ways. Um, they, you know, they, uh, you know, a, a tr those trash containers, those bear resistant containers, um, they work, but they break and people are in a hurry. You know, it, it, the problem tends to be in like downtown with a lot of restaurants and you have three restaurants using the same dumpster. People are in a hurry. The staff are in a hurry and the staff, you know, um, one problem was like the, the staff, a lot of them were Spanish speaking and nobody had talked to them in Spanish about this is why it's so important to lock the container every time you run out there. You know, I know you're busy and you don't really have time. You just want to throw it in. But if you don't lock it up, here's the here's what happens to these animals. So um, and the, the other problem is that. With three restaurants using the same 
trash receptacle when a bear gets into it you know okay there's fines you need to have fines and enforcement for something like this to work well how do you know who left it open how where does the ticket go who pays the ticket the person you know all three restaurants can say prove it you know prove that it was one of my people that did it you know we locked we always lock the container so um and that's the same with condo developments <clears throat> you'll have one dumpster excuse me for a whole you know for six units and who gets who gets the ticket and and um a lot of the folks in condos in aspen are tourists from out of town and they don't know the rules number one number two don't know the situation and the consequences for the bear yeah <clears throat> so it's um it's trickier than it <clears throat> may seem i was surprised that the when they transplanted the macaques to the old mine that they didn't just go back to the city that they actually just kind of stay there well they um they do escape um yeah i mean they have <coughs> sorry <coughs> a bit of a frog in my throat um they have high fences which keep them into a certain extent and they tend to they tend to go out to the a neighborhoods directly adjacent to the mine area and and harass people in the town so they do get out but they don't they don't you know there's plenty of food in the, the general area of the of the mine and they tend to just stay there they don't make their way all the way back to the prime minister's house <laughs> i think one of my favorite uh favorite anecdotes was the bears in yos or in yellowstone they can identify the um minivans have the snacks and then when you transplant them to a different part of the park uh break-ins in that part just go yeah. up right <laughs> yeah exactly they yeah it was interesting that the minivan was the mo most um likely to be hit i mean they 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 <laughs> um, and and the first there was a thought that well maybe the the door the locking mechanism is easier for bears to get into but in fact it's just because minivans hold lots of children and children are spilling and dropping sweet smelling crumbs and that that's probably what the bears are going after and it, and it, you know it was, as with human crime crime in quotes um it, it turned out to be a small number of individuals that were just doing this over and over and over so you know lowering the population of bears in general isn't going to solve the problem and this is true with with you know cabin break-ins and things it's 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 the bears that have figured it out and have decided this is a better way to get food than going out into the woods and looking for natural sources of food. So um, it, it's much more important to just to focus on the few bears that are doing that and that are training their cubs, because that's just going to perpetuate the problem. So, um, you know, people who talk about, well, you know, why don't you just open up the hunting and let, you know, hunt them and hunt the numbers down. That's not the way to do it because it's a small it's it's a relatively small number of, of animals that have lost their fear of humans and that are actually going into um, cabins and houses here in the upper peninsula of michigan we have um, we have wolves and coyotes and there will be every like 10 or 15 years there's like a, a wolf purge and we get to the point where there's no more wolves but then the deer start running amok because there's no natural predators and we have to bring wolves back in Yep. So, yeah. So I don't think people see this cycle. It's just so strange. <laughs> no, I know. It's it is really um it's really tough. That happens. Yeah, that happens all the time when you have a bounty on it. And there I remember seeing stuff from the early 1900s about that when there was a bounty. Well, there were bounties on everything. But there was a, a bounty on coyotes, I think it was. And and so the the coyotes had been the numbers had been taken way down and then there was this plague of small rodents i forget if it was squirrels or which squirrels it was but then you know because the the coyotes there weren't any coyotes to be um preying on the, on the squirrels so the squirrel population was like yee <laughs> <laughs> we're going crazy i mean there's probably other factors I and mean, the food was probably plentiful that year but anyway without you you remove so it's a system of checks and balances and you remove one piece of it and there are always going to be consequences of some kind yeah yeah 
But it's always, it was funny too when I was reading the section on coyotes in the book because people always estimate like two or three times more coyotes than they yeah. are actually hearing. From the sounds, <laughs> yeah. I love that someone did a study where they 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 played in, a, they, there's like a technical term, yip yapping. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they play these recordings of two coyotes and people are like, that's, that's 10 coyotes, you know. <laughs> Uh, and my, my husband was just down in LA staying near Griffith Park with with a friend and he he it was the same thing he's like there was all oh, like that in the middle of the night there's like 20 coyotes howling I'm like I bet that was three <laughs> yeah and then and then when you try and go out and find these coyotes they're there, there's just like one small den. <laughs> yeah that was yes that's been the case in San Francisco up in the Presidio there's a report, you know, people have this sense of it being overrun when, um, and, and sometimes it's they're, they're seeing the same coyote in multiple places and they have that, there's this sense that they're, they're everywhere. And, and the, um, the same thing happens with, with cougars, with mountain lions, uh, because of doorbell cameras, which, you know, people get a, a glimpse, a mountain lion on their doorbell camera and they send, they, they post it and it goes viral and at least through the neighborhood people are like oh my god there's a coyote there's a cougar and then someone else will go oh i saw i saw another one you know and maybe the, the this one mountain lion that every night at 3 a.m kind of wanders through the neighborhood and then leaves and and no one would know if not for the camera on the porches but now people are like we're being invaded by mountain lions <laughs> It's just strange the the overreaction, and then like, what are fish and game supposed to do? It's one random mountain lion, you know, like. No, I know, and it, it is. Um, it's it's a tough. It's where they walk a tough line. They are dealing with the people who you know. Uh, they'll see an animal, a bear or a mountain lion, in you know, cross a field near their house and they'll call them oh my god there's a bear there's a mountain lion like get come out here do something and fish and wildlife's like there's nothing to be done it's an ant like, consider yourself lucky you saw a large wild mammal passing through your yard that's so cool um and then on the other extreme when there's an animal that is really becoming a threat to public safety with its aggressiveness we, you know through no fault of its own, just because it's figured out how to get access to easy food is usually this scenario. Um, then you know, there's there's uh, people who object when that animal is destroyed, and and death death threats to fish and game officers, and and that, that that's and, and these people are uh, a lot of them are people who are drawn to the job. Uh, because of their love of wildlife and wanting to be outdoors in nature. And uh, that's a horrible part of their job to have to put down a bear. And, um, and, then, on, and then to layer on top of that, the opprobrium from people in the community or, or people who just heard about it and, and are not really familiar with the, they don't have any context of what led to that decision and, you know, threatening to kill them and, yeah, yeah, that's not a job I would want. What I'm getting from Fuzz is that people are the problem. <laughs> yeah, people, people are the, yeah, they are. But, it, you know, it's, you, you also, you have to put yourself in the position of, you know, if so, if you're a sheep rancher and your life is sheep, it's not just a business. You are emotionally attached to those animals. And then, you know, you come out during the birthing season, the lambing season, and, you know, you see a wolf or a mountain lion going after a newborn. I mean, it's you understand their frustration and anger. Um, I think the, the key here is to bring together both sides of this debate and talk about solutions, you know, ways to coexist that that both sides will feel comfortable with you know both the ranchers and the wildlife advocates and and so bringing them to these to these folks together into a room with somebody who's who's skilled at 
encouraging conversation and encouraging, you know, compromise and, and solutions. And so I think, you know, there is there is hope um, and people can be the solution, but it's it really is not easy. It's not easy. You know, if you're asking people to, to, to step into someone else's life and see the situation through their eyes and people aren't very good at that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I like the I like the vast view that you give in this book and all of your books, really. Um, it just kind of helps people, me in particular, <laughs> see <laughs> different points of view. Right. Because I'm I'm usually like, oh, leave the animals alone, except for when that bear is attacking my dog. <laughs> yeah, I know that's that's the thing. I'm the, I mean, I'm the same way. I'm, I, you know, I I love squirrels i think they're adorable but we have squirrels in our yard i can't put anything i can't grow a plant on my deck unless it's a spiky succulent <laughs> take, take that you know you will not take this plant you will not but then they just dig in you know they just dig in the dirt because they're looking for places to store their nuts and i say that with such scorn <laughs> um, but, um you know and, and it's frustrating i mean i'm not ever i'm not going to set a trap i'm not going to harm the squirrels i just you know we keep them out of the attic and that's the important thing but it is frustrating if you, you know i can't i can't grow any i can't put a pot of geraniums on the deck because the squirrels will dig it up so i i mean i i, I understand yeah, that's you know when it gets personal that's when your attitude changes and, and it's a little tougher to maintain your your sense of equilibrium and fairness and, yeah <laughs> So, uh, were you writing the book as you went to all these different places? Well, I usually, well, I wouldn't be, when I go to these places, I'm on a reporting trip. I'm not writing at the time. I'm just uh, gathering information and then I'll, I try to write the chapters as soon as I can after I get back, but often I'll be off reporting something else and I won't get to it for a while. So, um, there's often a disconnect chronologically between when I reported it and when I'm writing it. It feels like um because you write a lot of this in first person that it it just feels like the right way to write it. Um and so I was wondering if you were writing it because you're always like, oh, in an hour I'm meeting so and so from the veterinarian. <laughs> oh yeah, it does sound like I'm writing it on the scene. It does, yeah. Right, right. In fact I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm telling the story in the in the in the moment. Yeah. Months later. <laughs> yeah. It's just a really I feel like it's a really good narrative choice for the first person in these instances. Because um, yeah. then I can. Yeah. yeah, I think that the doing it in present tense. Um, it's a little bit more alive than saying I was there and he did that. But it is, as you point out, a bit of an artifice. Because I'm not in that moment. But then, you know, when the person's reading the book two years later, yeah. obviously I'm not still there. <laughs> Time stopped. Time stood still. <laughs> I am forever sitting in the office of the wildlife control officer in New Delhi. Yeah. So you must have so much research done, though. How do you whittle it down to what's going to be in the book? Oh, it's easy because it's just the best stuff. <laughs> it's the It's the moments that are the same moments that if you came back from a trip, you would tell your friends. So oh. it's very clear to me what will be in there and what isn't all that interesting. And then and then based on, um, you know, those things sort of create the narrative scaffold. And then I, you know, on that, I kind of fill in the science and the, you know, I'll, I'll do some secondary reporting after I've been on the trip because something that happened is a good way to set up some information or some study or something some element of the research that you know that fits in nicely there so uh yeah that's kind of how it works are you working on anything right now i'm working on another book yep i'm working on another exciting. Book. yeah yeah i mean i'm in the midst of yeah a bunch of chapters <laughs> at once if i if i had my way i'd report one and then I'd be left alone to write it, and then I'd report another <laughs> one. But what happens is often, like you know, five trips happen at the same time because I can't schedule them. Really, it depends on who I'm going to see and what they're going to be doing and when they're doing it. So uh, this it's a hectic fall. 
how do you find the right people to contact? I, you know, I, I don't know until I go visit them really whether they are the right person, but most people, most people are, are interesting. Um, there's, there's, it usually works out fine. Some people are, are, I just feel incredibly lucky to have stumbled onto them because they're such complicated and interesting characters. But um, there's always some element of them that it works somehow. Not, I mean, not all. I mean, there have been times where I've gone somewhere and I just thought, nope, <laughs> not very interesting, not going to be in the book. Um, uh, actually, that was more from back in my magazine article days. I can remember a couple times these things we just canceled the story. But there have been times where I've gone to report a chapter and then left it out. That's got to be hard because. It's got to feel like a wasted trip or like <laughs> oh, you can't sure. salvage stuff. It's a waste of time and money, but that's part of the it's part of the job. Um, it's nothing to be done about it. I think it's important to realize to, to recognize when something isn't worth including because there is a tendency, I think, to go, well, I spent all this time on it. I got to shove it in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've been to archives where I've just. I thought there'd be a lot of material and it's kind of nothing there, but you know, you spend two days plowing around and a bunch of files and, and you want to put something in, but you have to kind of restrain yourself because it's, it's, you got to follow your instinct. If it doesn't seem all that interesting, it probably isn't. <laughs> Do you usually get a lot of feedback from your editor or not so much? Uh, yeah. Um, it depends on the book. I mean, my editor tends to be, concerned with, um, you know, how are you going to open the book? You know, what's the first chapter going to be? Um, she's not that involved line by line. I have a very good copy editor who um, serves as a bit of a fact checker. She checks she, as much as she can. She checks not not like interviews and things reported on the scene, but studies and any reference to proper nouns and places and people. Uh, she's very, very good. So um, I'm, I'm far more engaged with her for a longer period of time than uh, my um, editor editor. But my editor is, is a good, she's a good fit for me because she's not a science person. She's a poet and a lover of literature and she's um, sort of outside the, the worlds that I'm presenting. So if something seems, she just doesn't get it, she'll just say this doesn't, this, this needs to be clearer. You know, this is, I don't, or this is too long. I don't care. <laughs> and she's also just good, uh, a good set of eyes for the humor. Sometimes something falls flat and she'll mark that. She'll just go, no. <laughs> so, so that's good. Because I don't show it to anyone else before I turn it in. Okay. Well, thank you, Mary, for joining me today. <laughs> Oh, you're so welcome, Dakota. Thanks for having me on the podcast. And if anybody hasn't read Fuzz, it is out in hardback and paperback right now. So I suggest picking it up. It's very fun and lots of fun knowledge. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. As always, have a great day. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you.